Good morning and welcome to my series on the Jewish background to the words of Jesus. I'm looking specifically in the next few weeks at the I Am sayings of Yeshua. And the reason is that they tell us about who Yeshua is and how he relates to us. And I genuinely believe that in order to, to really understand what Yeshua wants us to know, we have to ask about the Hebraic and the Jewish context into which he was speaking. As we do this, I think we will have a look and we'll see if the Jewish background sheds any new light on what we already understand from these incredible statements that Yeshua made. I was uh, write, helping somebody write a job application yesterday and in it you have to write a personal statement explaining why you are specifically suited for the job, what talents you have, what makes you unique and what makes you stand out. And the I am sayings of Yeshua are his personal statements. They tell us what is unique about him. They tell us what is his mission. It's become a this word that we so often use in church and in communities about mission has become a, a word for the, the business workplace. We're talking about needing a mission statement. And in many ways, the I am sayings of Yeshua are his mission statement. They are telling us who he is and why he's uniquely and perfectly suited to the task that was set before him. A well-known uh, Jewish writer speaking about God said this, God is not an object of discovery, but the subject of revelation. And I think what he was trying to convey to us is this, that God wants to reveal himself to us. And the pursuit of knowledge about God may make us learn it, but it won't satisfy the heart or the soul. When I was studying in Bible college many years ago, we used to say, if you're all in the head, you dry up. And if you're all in the tummy, you blow up. Um, or all in the heart, you blow up. So I think there's um, a balance between what we know about God and what how we know God. So yes, knowing about God helps us to know him. Last night, when I asked the question, how do we get to know God? Somebody wisely said, well, like getting to know anybody, you spend time with him or her. You um, journey with them in life. You spend time listening to them. And that's how we get to know and how to experience God as well. We journey with him. We study his word. Not just for what we can learn about him, but so that we can know him. I was thinking that um, I often write Bible studies and I have to find something to say to others. And I decided that in this period of lockdown, as I'm writing Bible studies and uh, doing talks, that I wanted to experience God's word, not just for others, but for myself. Because when I do that, I experience God rather than learn about him and communicate truth about him. In the Hebrew scriptures, the Tanakh, from the very opening pages, we discover that God, the creator, is revealing himself to human beings. First of all, to Adam and Eve, and then we have all the encounters of the people through the book of Genesis. And we discover that God is a God who wants to be known, a God who's interested in sharing himself with his people with those whom he has created now we could sum the old testament up the old testament up the tanakh by saying that is the record the history of god's dealings with human beings and in particular the jewish people whom he called to be his own he revealed to them and to us as we read the scriptures who he is but not only that, we learn about what he planned to do, not only for the Jewish people, but for all humanity. 
The scriptures are more than simply the record of God's history with human beings. They contain the unfolding love story of the creator making himself known to us. So why am I focusing on the I am sayings of Yeshua? Well, in them, he gives himself names. And in the Bible, names are really important because they teach us something about the person. Or they teach us something about God. Or they teach us something about the way God relates to us and we relate to him. I read somewhere when I was doing a study a number of years ago, um, the answer to the question, what's in a name? Well, a name tells you what something is. So if I know what a pen is, ah, I can write with a pen. And I'm only limited by my own personal imagination about how much or what I write. But there are only so many things you can do with a pen because a pen is simply a pen. And it has its own set of limitations. But at the same time as having limitations, it gives you capacity to do something, to create something, to write something. And the names that we have tell us something about uh, ourselves. So in um, Scottish, because my name is ultimately a Scottish name, it is Fiona. And Fiona in Gaelic means fear, as in fair-skinned, although I'm not really that fair. <laughs> I think I conned my family. I was born with blue eyes and blonde hair. I'm not quite sure what went wrong. <laughs> but so they called me Fiona. Now my sister's called Melanie, and that comes from the word mel melanin. And melanin is what makes your skin really um, tan in the sunshine. And when my sister was born, she had a shock of black hair and really fairly dark skin because my mother came from Egypt. So names tell you something about us. Told me, tells you that my father wanted to convey something about our Scottish heritage. But names can also be used to limit us. The children of Israel were called slaves. Slaves had to function, they had a job to do, they had to do the work, they didn't have freedom. And so to be a slave was really a very limiting description of who the children of Israel were. But when God redeemed them, when he took them out, he called them his children. So before when they were slaves, there was a great limitation placed upon them. It's a real limitation. But when they came out of slavery, when God took them and met them at Mount Sinai after he delivered them, he calls them his children. Now, being a child of God, being the people of God, enabled them to fulfill their potential. And God, in that potential, gave them a destiny, a ministry, and a purpose. Now, when we understand that we are God's children, we understand that we also have destiny, purpose, and mission. And knowing who God is will help us, I believe, to really enable us to reach that potential, to fulfill our capacity, to be the people God has created us to be. But hang on a minute. I think we should get back onto track here. Now, what's in a name is important. There's a promise that the prophet Isaiah wrote that comes from the very heart of God. In Isaiah 52, verse 6, we read, My people will know my name, therefore in that day they will know that it is I who foretold it. Here you have God speaking about people knowing his name. But something struck me 
about another promise that God gives to those who seek him. In Jeremiah chapter 29 from verse 12 and the following verses we read, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And further down in the verses it says, And I will be found by you. And I love that. I absolutely love that statement. And what struck me about it is that not so much that I will find God if I find for him. If, sorry, not so much that I will find God if I search for him, but rather he will be found by me when I search for him with my whole heart. And what strikes me is this. If I search for him and I find him, this is what I have done. But if I search for him, he will be found by me. In other words, God is meeting me halfway. God is telling me that if I give my heart to the pursuit of the knowledge of God and the pursuit of the presence of God, he will not be hidden from me because he wants me to know him. And so he says, I will be found by you. This is a powerful reminder that the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, wants to be found by us, wants to be known by us, indeed longs to reveal himself to us. And this is why he said, my people will know my name. In that day, they will know that it is I who foretold it. And God continues this self-revelation in the life, the ministry and the person of his son, Yeshua. Yeshua spoke to Philip once and said to him, Have I been with you so, for so long a time? Haven't you come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. You see, as we get to know more about Yeshua, we learn more about the Father. When I said that the I am statements are Yeshua's personal um, mission statement, listen to this. As we look at them, we have to ask ourselves, what is a name? What's in a name? And what do his self-declarations mean? So here are the seven declarations of Yeshua that we find in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. I sustain. I nourish. I'm the light of the world. He's the one that if we follow, we won't have to walk in darkness. He says, I'm the door. We know that as we go through that door, we walk into relationship with God. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the one who looks after you. I'm the one who comes after you when you go astray. I'm the resurrection and the life. Wow. He's going before us. He is the evidence that we will live and have life if we choose him. Then he says, I'm the way, the truth and the life. In other words, the only way that we can come to the Father is through him. The only truth that we need, the only real truth in life is this, that he loves us. And then he says, I'm the true vine. And he calls us the branches and he calls us to abide in him. Bread of life, light of the world, door, good shepherd, resurrection and life, way, truth and life, and true vine. Here are his seven personal statements. But there's one extra that many people miss, and I think it's the foundational statement. I think it's the one upon which all the other I am declarations of Yeshua rest. And he says this, before Abraham was, I am. Now, the Gospel of John is fascinating. And John was really passionate about one thing. He wants to explain 
the purpose of the life and ministry of Yeshua. He wants to convince his readers that there is life giving truth in the person of Yeshua. But he also feels, I think, that he needs to convince his hearers and those who will read his gospel of the deity of Yeshua. He wrote these words near the end of the gospel. In John chapter 20, verse 30, we read, Now Yeshua did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing may have life in his name. John opens his gospel with the famous declaration about who Yeshua is. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. He opens his gospel and closes his gospel with the same message. Now, what I like about John's gospel is he really does tell it all. The good, the bad, and the ugly. What do I mean? Well, he allows us to see how these declarations, how these words of Yeshua are both remarkable and challenging. And while they caused many to believe, to believe. They also made many absolutely furious at the audacity of Yeshua to speak as if he were God. And I've said this before, many scholars will say that Yeshua himself never said, I am God. He never said, I am divine. He never claimed to be God. I'm not so sure that that's true. Why? Because I believe that when we unpack his words, his ministry, his life, we see that what he said and what he did were all a declaration of who he was and who he is, both then and now for us. So each week we're going to unpack these words, these I am statements, and seek to understand them in the light of their original Hebraic background and try to answer the question, what did his first hearers understand when he spoke them? And then see if there's anything new to add to and to grow our understanding of who Yeshua is to us and for us as we listen to his, to his words with fresh ears and open hearts. Now, I'm going to start with the statement that is often missed, and it's the one upon which all of the others rest. Yeshua says in John chapter 8, Before Abraham was, I am. It is the most unique statement. And why is it unique? Because unlike the others, he doesn't qualify it by saying, I am the true vine. I am the light. He simply says, Before Abraham was, I am. Now, I think that this takes us back to the very first I am in Scripture, in the Bible, when God revealed himself to Moses, when God shared his covenant name with Moses. So what happens in this encounter? Well, Moses meets God in the very place where he's going to lead the children of Israel to, the place where for the very first time, Moses will hear the voice of God. It's also where, as a nation, the children of Israel will collectively hear the voice of God speaking to them on that very mountain. Exodus 3 verse 12 said, reads this. So, and this is the word of God speaking to Moses. I will certainly be with you. And this will be the sign that I have sent you. When you go and, br and you have brought out the people of Egypt, you will also serve God on this mountain. Horeb. And in Deuteronomy um, 5.2, we read, God made this covenant with us at Horeb. And so what we see is the mountain of Horeb and Mount Sinai are simply different names for the same mountain. And what draws Moses in is the sight of a bush that's on fire. 
Well, that might not be quite so unusual, but what was really unusual about this was that the bush was not being consumed by the flames. And he sees the angel of the Lord there, but what he hears is the voice of the Lord. The voice from heaven speaking to him. And what does God have to say to Moses in this encounter? Or perhaps the better question, what is God going to reveal to Moses? Well, God introduces himself, firstly, by saying, I am the God of your fathers. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And then he begins to reveal to, to Moses his heart, his plan, his commission, the job that um, God is calling Moses to do. But what's so marvelous is God's, when God is speaking to him, he, he tells Moses that he's heard the anguish. He's heard the cries of his people. And he declares that the time for deliverance has come and Moses is to become his instrument. But Moses is afraid of what the Lord is asking him to do. And he says to God, what will I tell them when they ask me for your name? Now, God could have simply said, tell them the God of your forefathers has sent you. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But God says to him, I am who I am. Tell the people that I am has sent me to you. In Hebrew, this name is represented by the vowels, yod he vav he. And this word, which many scholars and most Jewish theologians and writers, we, we've come to believe that even though we don't have the original sounds because the vowels weren't written, that it means or it sounds like Yahweh. Some of the older translations when they translated Yahweh into English, wrote Jehovah. This is the vowels, the Hebrew, that is behind the English Jehovah, or when you read in your English Bibles, Lord in capital letters, not Lord with one capital L, but capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. What you have is the, the Hebrew behind it, yod He vav He. And this is the name that's considered so holy by the Jewish people that they, the, the Orthodox won't use it. In fact, the ultra-Orthodox and many Orthodox find that to use God's names are disrespectful. And the danger is that if you get accustomed to use them, you might dishonor them. And so we've come to use or replace in the Hebrew Bibles, yod heh vav -Heh with Adonai. Now, this word, Yahweh, is related to the Hebrew verb to be. And this is why it's translated as I am who I am. And the name speaks, as you all know, to God's eternal nature. But God here is saying more than I am simply eternal. I am who I am. He's talking about his self-existence. And what do I mean by that? To say that God is self-existent is to say that he needs nothing outside of himself to sustain him. When we talk about Yeshua being pre-existent, we're talking about him being existing before his human birth, that he was in glory in heaven with the Father for all eternity. He existed before he came to earth as a human being. God is revealing something, not just about his eternal nature, but his eternal being. He exists now. He has always existed and he will always exist. As I've said before, this name is a very special name to the Jewish people. And I believe that it points to a relational name. It tells us 
that it is the name that God gave when he commissioned Moses, when he opened his heart to him, when he speaks to the children of Israel. It's known as his covenant name. But names reveal not only the truth about who he is and how he acts, but they express God's relationship to us. So let's look at a few names in the Bible and, and just give you a few examples. Joshua, which in Hebrew is Yehoshua, means the Lord is my salvation. Elijah, Eliyahu means my God is the Lord. And hallelujah, which we sing and say so often, means praise the Lord. The names given to both people and God reveal truth for us. And a quick look at some of the names of God do the same thing. They reveal his character. They reveal his being. And they reveal his relationship to us. Interestingly, before I do that, the rabbis tell us that we approach the, the name of God's... We have, put your tongue back in. We approach the question of God's names from the wrong end just like Moses did, or at least that's what they suggest. They suggest that what Moses was actually asking is, by which name should I use? Now, one of the things we learn about the names of God is that they reveal the character of God. So the Talmud explains that Moses was being asked, or Moses rather was asking God to be taught about the great name. So God said to him, you want to know my name? I'm called after my actions. When I judge my creatures, I'm called Elohim. When I wage war against evildoers, I am Sevaot. When I suspend judgment on a person's sins, I am El Shaddai. And when I sit on the throne of mercy, I am called yod heh vav -He, Lord. And the rabbis teach us that the names of God are a manifestation of his divinity. Now, that's a really interesting statement. The names of God are a manifestation of his divinity. Does that mean that the names of Yeshua are also a manifestation of his divinity? But let's have a look at how names work with God. Now, when I did this last night in the Bible study, somebody said, but all the names are relational. Because I might know somebody's name, so I know that my husband is called Marim or Maris. And when I first met him, I knew his name, but I didn't know him. It was just the name that described the person sitting at the other side of the room. It told me nothing about him, other than he had a name in Romanian. When I got to know him, his name became personal because he became my friend and later my husband. However, names do are either primarily relational or primarily informational. Or they reveal characteristics about a person. My name was chosen to reveal that I had fair skin. Turns out that didn't quite work out that way, but that was the reason it was chosen. And it was chosen to identify me as having grandparents who also came from Scotland. So when we look at God's names, let's look at the very first name given to us in scripture, Elohim. It's the first name of scripture and it speaks of God's strength and creative power. It's, it speaks of God's unmatched, unapproachable majesty and sovereignty as the creator of the universe. And it's the very first name that's given to us in scripture. And as someone pointed out last night, it's unique in that it's plural. And there are two reasons for this. One, and the first one perhaps I think is the greatest of the two reasons, is because God was revealing from the very beginning that he's more than a single being. He's a, a unified being. That in him exist 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Another reason for the plurality of this name may also be that El was a Canaanite name. It was the name of ancient gods, and in fact, all gods were called El. And El simply means God. And some scholars suggest that Elohim also means that he is the God over all gods. And we see that in the Shema, this sense that um, here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He is the one God. He is the only God, the true God. Another name that we read early on is El Elyon, God Most High. Again, this is the God we understand who's revealed as sitting in heaven in glory. He's above us. And then we have El Roi, the God who sees. Now, this could be informational, it's a character. He's a God who sees and knows. But the name is revealed when God meets Hagar in the, the wilderness when she's suffering, when she's run away from Sarah who was treating her and causing her pain. And in this meeting, God shows he is loving and omniscient. He knows all things and he sees all things and his knowledge is unlimited and he uses it to demonstrate his love. El Roi is the God who sees, the God who responds to the pain of his people. El Shaddai, one of the, the church's most favorite, I guess, names for God and made famous by that song, El Shaddai. It means mighty God or the Almighty as the, Sep the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures um, wrote it. But it can be translated also as my God or my Lord. In Psalm 91, in the, it's translated as the God of heaven. And when, God, when Abraham met El Shaddai, he fell before him in worship. And so, we see that some names are about God in particular. They tell us who he is. They describe his being, his, his actions, but others are more relational. They bring us into intimacy with God, the God who sees our pain. And then we have the God who heals. This is the God who meets us in the place of our suffering. So the names of God are both relational and informational. But Yahweh, yod heh vav -He, this is the God who reveals himself as approachable and loving, a personal and faithful God in whom all trust can be placed, the God who will redeem, the God who will restore relationship that had been shattered in the Garden of Egypt between the creator and the created. He does this first by covenanting with Israel and secondly through the new covenant that he makes with all humanity. I just find the names of God help me to worship. I bought a book a number of years ago and um, it was a daily reading and each day was a different name for God, revealing something about who God is and how he relates to me. I found it so It really helped me to worship God, to know him better, to understand who he is. And I heartily recommend um, a similar study for anybody who wants to know God. But while all of this discussion and all this debate is well and good, and it might even be very interesting, what was really God saying to Moses when he called himself, I am? who I am. As I said, the rabbis have told us that the names of God are a manifestation of his divinity. Here we have his eternal nature. 
They teach us how God relates to creation. And the name that he reveals here is about his being and his existence. Rashi, the great commentator, reminds us that it also means I will be what I will be because here the Hebrew could be translated in the present or in the future. And I found this really helpful because Rashi suggests that the Lord is saying more than simply I am, I exist, I've always existed. Take me or leave me. There's a deeper meaning hidden here in the way that God chose to reveal himself. Now, those of you who've known me for many years have known that my weight has gone up and it's gone down and fluctuated. There was a long period when I was overweight, a number, years and years ago, probably about 15 years ago. And um, I got to the point where I said to myself, if people can't see beyond what's on the outside and want to know me as a person, then they're not worth my time or effort. And that was a way of protecting myself. I also said to myself that when I do lose weight and these people want, now, want me now to be their friend in public spaces, well, I won't have any time for them. You see, sometimes you're judged by what you are or what you appear to be, but God, doesn't want us to judge him and what he appears to be. He wants to look deeper and know who he truly is because that's his heart. Now, what Rashi challenged me here to think about was the deeper meaning. You see, God chooses how and when to reveal himself. He decides what to ascribe to himself and what God is saying here is not simply, this is who I am, accept it. Rashi put it similarly. He said this, he said something along these lines that God was making a declaration to Moses for the people of Israel. I am who I am. I have always existed. But in my eternal existence, I know you. I also have been with you. And I'm with the children of Israel in their suffering. And I will be with them in their deliverance. I will be with them in redemption. I will be with them in their journey. You see, God is determining how he acts. And he, he said that God was ultimately declaring to the Jewish people, I will be with them always. I am with them always. And I will be to them what they, not what they need me to be, but what I need. <laughs> Fiona, put your teeth back in again. Rashi basically said this. I will be to the children of Israel what I deem they need me to be. So I think we often put God in the box and we want him to be what we think we need him to be. We know when we want healing and we want God to come to us as healer. But God sometimes comes to deal with our sins. Think about the man I spoke about last week who came. His friends carried him to meet Yeshua. And Yeshua didn't say to him, be healed. He said, your sins are forgiven. Because he understood that that man's greatest need was not healing, but was forgiveness. You see, God decides. God knows better. Now, those of you who are parents will know this, that you don't give your children everything they want. You give them what they need at the right time. Sometimes you give them special gifts. Sometimes you give them things that they desire just for the pleasure of giving and for the pleasure of seeing their joy in the gift. But with God, we see that that also works. That God will decide what we need at the right time 
and will provide. You see, God is not a supernatural heavenly supermarket where we go with our shopping list of prayer requests. No, he's the eternal God who wants us to be known to him, known by him, and for us to know him and to be known by us. I think what Rashi is challenging us to do is to embrace what God reveals to us about himself when he does it and to accept the manner in which God reveals himself to us. You see, God challenges, I believe, to us that is that we can't decide to have God on our own terms. I will go this far for God, but no further, because God has gone all the way for us. We should know that that, that line doesn't work. People say, oh, I believe in God, but I don't need the Bible. I believe in God, but I don't need to be in fellowship with other believers. I do it my way. But you see, God is not permitting us that liberty. He wants us to accept him on his terms. He wants us to walk his way. And the remarkable thing about that is, he doesn't give us the liberty to accept him as we want him. But when we accept him for who he is, then we will discover what true liberty and freedom looks like. Because we will have the freedom to become the people that he has called us to be and the constraints and the restraints that have been placed upon us by others and by society, he will begin to re re begin to remove them. He'll begin to change our lives so that we fulfill our potential we fulfill our calling, that we become all that God created us to be. And I think that's the greatest desire of all of our hearts. And God's greatest self-revelation didn't begin with Moses and the people of Israel at Sinai. The greatest revelation began in the life and the person of his son, Yeshua. And I'm not minimizing God's personal revelation, either in the Garden of Eden as creator, or with Moses at Sinai as the, the giver of covenant, the maker of covenants, the rest, the restorer of broken relationships. I'm not mitigating that or saying that it isn't valuable and important and vital to our understanding of who God is. But what I'm saying is this, that in the person, the work and the life of Yeshua, we have his greatest revelation. This is what Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul, spoke in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, the God, and this is the God who um, Paul is referencing as the creator, the one who's the bringer of light, the bringer of life. Paul goes on to say, for God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, is the one who has shone in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Messiah. You see, when we know God, when we see Yeshua, we see God himself. Now, I'm sure that as we look at the I am statements of Yeshua, that if we want to answer the question, of what was Yeshua really saying when he said before Abraham I before Abraham was I am well what was Yeshua saying well I I know that you will all say well it's about his eternal nature it's about his eternal existence and you're correct but I think there's more than simply saying he's eternal. He was also pre-existent. In other words, he was there before creation began, before we got to experience him in human form. And of course, I know you'll all jump straight to uh, John chapter one. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. He was with God in the beginning and all things were made through him and apart from him, nothing was made that has been made that has come into being. 
And further down, we read these glorious words. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we looked upon his glory, the glory of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies about him crying out. This is he of whom I said, the one who comes after me is above me. Why? Because he existed before me. You see, this statement of Yeshua, I am, is more than a simple statement of his existence. I believe that what Yeshua was saying by taking this declaration is that he is the same as God who revealed himself at the burning bush and therefore he shares the same nature as God. He was declaring he exists in a way that you and I can't. We have limited abilities to determine who we are and what we do. Yes, to some extent we make decisions about where we live, what we will do for um, a living, what we will uh, choose to spend our time and our money on. We all will determinedly seek to fulfill our hopes in some way. We will all seek to find our potential. But we all face limitations. For those of us sitting here in the UK, we face lockdown. If I get out in my car and drive, hopefully I will after lockdown, I'm still, there's a limit to the speed limit. There's also a limit by how fast my car can go. In Yeshua saying that I am, that I am, I think he's saying that he's without limitations because he exists before all things, because he existed then in eternity. He exists now and he will exist in the future. He doesn't say before Abraham was, I was. He wasn't simply saying that I existed before Abraham. He uses the present tense because he wants us to know and understand something. That he is eternal. He is the one who will decide how and when to reveal himself. He chooses what declarations describe who he is and how he acts in relation to us. It's no wonder we read what happened when Yeshua said these words. In John 8, verse 58 to 59, we read Yeshua saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him. But Yeshua hid himself and went out of the temple. You see, they understood what Yeshua was saying. When we read these words, we simply say, yes, he's saying he's eternal. And because we already believe that he is eternal, it's easy to make the connection. But the hearers understood Yeshua was making a connection with the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, who revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush. And that's why they stoned him. Yeshua was basically saying to them, All that the Lord is, I am. And just as God was telling his people that he would be with them, and he would be all to them that they needed, both then and forever. So Yeshua, in saying, I am, is making that same promise. And this promise wasn't limited to his physical lifetime, because he made this promise to us all. In Matthew 18, at the very end of the Gospel, in chapter 28, Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. And Yeshua came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, to the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He's saying, just as the Lord himself said, I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. 
And we read those words in Deuteronomy 31 verse 6. The promise of God to his people Israel is this, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. And this is why Yeshua makes that very same promise. The promise that will echo for all eternity. I will never leave you or forsake you. I am with you. Behold, says Yeshua, I am with you always to the end of the age. You see, Yeshua fulfills it perfectly because in Yeshua, God has shown us that he will never abandon us. He will never leave us. Yeshua has said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. He has said, I and the Father are one. In everything that Yeshua says and does, he is demonstrating his deity. He is demonstrating his divinity. People, as I have said, believe Yeshua didn't say it. I think if you were a Jewish person listening to him in the first century, he would have said exactly that. Yeshua claims to be God. He claims to be divine. It's blasphemy. Stone him. So when we hear with first century ears the words of Yeshua, they are powerful, revolutionary and changing. And we come face to face with the God who enters history, who makes himself known to the people of Israel, who enters in, in a most incredible way, human history, in the person and the work of his son, Yeshua. I found this incredible quote, and, I, and I'm going to read it to you because I think it sums up both what Yeshua was saying and what I am trying to also communicate. So someone else wrote this. Before Abraham came into being, God was already at work in human history. And it is the same God that worked throughout human history, to reveal himself as a God of salvation, deliverance and grace, who stands before you now in Jesus Christ. It takes all of us, it takes all of, all, sorry, it takes all this for us. First century Jews, Christians today, familiar with the Old Testament, would have understood all of this in this simple, before Abraham came to be, I am. Yeshua in the I am statements is going to reveal more to us about who he is, about how he is at work, how he reveals God at work in human history. The I am statements are all relational. Yes, they tell us who he is and how he exists. They tell us how to live with him, how to follow him, how to walk with him. So as Yeshua reveals more and more of himself to each one of us, may we embrace all that he has for us. May we embrace him as he is, as he is, not as we want, but as he is. The God, the God of all creation, the Redeemer. Is the one with whom Yeshua says, he and I are one. If you have seen the, me, you have seen the Father. Get to know me. And you will get to understand and see and have revelation of the glory of God. We are meant to look into the face of Yeshua and learn of him. And as we learn, grow in our walk and our relationship with the Lord Almighty, with Elohim, El Elyon, the God Most High longs to know you and he longs to know me. I hope this has been a blessing. I hope that it has added or contributed a little to what you know about God and in so doing will give you fuel for worship. <laughs> I was at a conference many years ago and this is what someone said. We were divided into groups and um, people had to choose the study group at this big conference by the name of the newspaper. You could go to the the Times, the
the observer, the um, express, and the mail. And they were all levels of... So I'd gone to the, um, the Sunday Times, and some people from the mail, the Daily Mail, came in and said, we had to repent because we thought that you were just interested in, in knowledge and in the end we felt kind of second-class citizens because we realized that we couldn't go to the Sunday Times group because it was too advanced for us and we had to repent because we discovered a truth that the more we know about God the more we have to worship God with and knowledge about God should be the fuel of your worship and so the pursuit of knowing God is a valuable pursuit in your life if you will use it to worship him to embrace him and to walk with him in the way that he is wanting for you and you will discover freedom joy and you will also discover that you have things potential ministry that you never expected walk with him today and allow him to shape your future and your destiny. Shalom, shalom.